We've seen hospitals attacked, schools attacked, um, shelters attacked. We've seen starvation. All of these things happening before our very eyes. It's the only televised um, genocide of our time. And yet it hasn't actually changed any policy. Quite the opposite. We're now seeing that it's digging in, for, digging in deeper, that Israel's now talking about changing the, the Middle East. They're talking about leadership and regime change. And so this, when you ask the issue of, did history begin on October the 7th? Obviously it did not, but the Zionists would have you believe that it did. Hamas on October 7th, um, whatever you think of the atrocities that accompanied uh, its breakout from the world's largest concentration camp, succeeded in putting the Palestinian agenda firmly on the global agenda. From a tactical point of view, this may have turned out to be a disaster, but from the strategic point of view of the pursuit and legitimation of Palestinian self-determination, it is a victory. Conversely, Israel has pursued an agenda, which Diana began to mention, from the very beginning, uh, it has desired to depopulate Palestine uh, so as to be able to settle it. And uh, it has seized on October 7th as the pretext for continuing the 100-year struggle to do that. Uh, and uh, so you have genocide in Gaza. You have uh, pogroms in the West Bank. Uh, that is an intensified effort at ethnic cleansing uh, and uh, a lot of violence uh, by the settlers. You have now the invasion of southern of southern Lebanon, the bombing of Beirut, the Dahia Doctrine, which was mentioned, um, and uh, and in in doing this, uh, Israel has strengthened itself tactically at the expense of a strategic defeat, because it no longer has the admiration of the world's people. Uh, the excuse that was offered by the Holocaust that we are victims and therefore. We should be immune from the consequences of our actions is gone. What is happening has made Israel, contrary to Mr. Netanyahu's claims, uh, not the, not the defender of Western civilization, but the primary factor destroying it, uh, its reputation globally. Uh, and Israel is also emerged in my country and in Europe, as Leila mentioned, as the main enemy of free speech. Uh, it is the it is the negation of our First Amendment. As somebody who's who watches and consumes both the Western press as well as the local press in in uh, in both languages, the the face that is presented, the Israeli face that is presented to the West, is a very different face that is presented inwardly, and the face that's presented to the the talking points that are given to the West are very different than the ones that are spoken inside. So the face that's presented to the West is that of the victim, um, the, the person who has been aggrieved, that um, it's, it's not only over and over recalling the Holocaust, but even the talking points were the largest number of, of deaths uh, on any single day um, since the Holocaust. Inside, that is not, and so therefore the victim. Inside, the talking point is quite the opposite. We are the powerful, we are the strong, we are the aggressor, we are going to show them who's boss, we are going to humiliate them. And that's what accounts for all of these videos that you may or may not have been seeing, the TikTok videos, the Instagram videos, the people dancing as they're blowing up, uh, the Israeli soldiers dancing as they're blowing up Palestinian homes, the Israeli soldiers going into Palestinian homes and wearing women's lingerie. The, the the destruction of the universities. This is all very much an internal talking point. Similarly, as he was talking about the idea of empire, to the West, what they're saying, the outward message is that of self-defense and it's needed and, and we need to protect ourselves. And yet the internal message that is given to Israelis is it's time for regime change. And we have the ability to change all of these regimes. We the Israelis, not numbering more than 10 million, have the ability to change the Iranian government, which represents 100 million um, Iranians. We, the Israelis, have the ability to change the Lebanese government. We, the Israelis, have the ability to change the Syrian government. 
we the Israelis also have the ability to take over southern Lebanon and build houses there. There are advertisements going out for the construction of houses in, south, in southern Lebanon. We the Israelis have the ability to build settlements in Gaza. They're actually doing boat tours for people so that they can see what has happened in Gaza for potential sites for settlements. So the, the, the dialogue that is given outward versus inward is so very different. And it, the only way that you can truly understand what Israel intends to do is to understand and listen to that internal dialogue, because that's the dialogue that they continue to pursue. And that's the one um, that they're pushing with, uh, with, with the public here. Diana's point about the difference between the domestic dialogue in Israel and, um, and the foreign propaganda of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs is very, very important. Uh, I, 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 see, I see there is now circulating a conversation with Bezalel Smotrich from 2016, in which he says, we're going to take Lebanon, we're going to take Damascus, we're going to take Jordan, we're going to take northern Saudi Arabia, we're going to take part of Iraq. Why not? Uh, this is a perversion of the supposed uh, gift to the sons of Abraham uh, of this region. Um, as I recall from my time in Saudi Arabia, uh, Israelis are not the only sons of Abraham. There's been a long raging debate um, here among Israeli politicians about who calls the shots. Is it that Israel calls the shots or does the United States call the shots? And in particular, since with the rise of this uh, quite fascist right, the, the consensus is that we being Israel, and I'm not talking about me, uh, but they, they'll say we being Israel are the ones who call the shots. The US is going to be the, the payer, um, but not the player. And that's what they specifically say also about, um, about the European Union. So for them, it's been this long raging debate. And, and when Netanyahu, you could see this play itself out um, when Netanyahu went to Congress back in, in July when he addressed Congress, where one of the things that was really very striking was he stood before Congress in addition to the millions of rounds of applause and the 60 standing ovations or whatever it was. Um, he said something, he said, you know, you all told me, you told me not to go into Rafah. And I went in, not, I went in despite that. And that was um, directly a message to a domestic Israeli audience saying, listen, I'm the one who's calling the shots. It's not the United States. The US can keep funding us and they will keep funding us. Um, and he's also said in the past that that he can control Congress, that that it's, it's not such a big deal. He can control America. And so this is very much the thinking here is that that the that it's Israel that is doing the calling the shots, not um, not the United States. Is it true? Um, you know, I I I think that this could be over, as Ambassador Freeman already said, very quickly. If that if that uh, pipeline of that uh, arm supply ended, it could certainly be over quickly. They they certainly do have a lot of arms here. Uh, but that it could it would certainly wind down to a halt. The problem is, is I don't think that that this president wants to see um, this genocide end. Um, he seems to be pretty happy about it. The United States clearly uh, no longer has any clout in the Middle East. We have no influence. Every time we have provided advice, assuming it was sincere, uh, which is it possibly not true. Um, to uh, the government of Israel, it has basically treated our advice with contempt. And I cannot imagine any human being more humiliated than President Biden uh, over the past year in that regard. The U.S. has been shown to be weak. It has been shown to be allied with uh, genocide. And it has shown to be supportive of the latest uh, Israeli outrage, which is the invasion of Lebanon. So uh, basically, we end up uh, to go to the basic question of this uh, webinar, we end up with the United States revealed as the uh, reliable instrument of Israeli foreign policy and the pursuit of Israeli interests at the expense of its own. Why does it seem like Israel has more influence in the U.S. than the U.S. has in Israel? <laughs> 
<laughs> is it financial leverage? Is it domestic yeah. politics? Is it geographic location? It's part part of a broader pattern. Mm -hmm. um, after the end of the Cold War, uh, Americans judged that foreign policy was a discretionary rather than a necessary activity. You could take it or leave it. Uh, we were omnipotent, omniscient, uh, and invulnerable. And even 9-11 didn't shake our belief in the essential triviality of foreign relations and foreign policy. So we began to apply to foreign policy the technique we had worked out politically at home, which is to take the interest group that is most interested, most intensely, and prepared to put up the most money in defense of its interests, put them in charge of making the policy and, and appointing the people to execute it. So the Black Caucus got Haiti, the Save the Whales movement got Norway and Japan, and in, the, in, in West Asia, it went to the Zionist lobby. Uh, so who, who runs US policy? It's Zionists who appoint themselves to positions. Who makes the policy? It is the Israel lobby, uh, which you know is very complex. Uh, and uh, so this is part of a broader pattern. And uh, I believe, I, uh, Khalil, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that roughly 70% of political donations to the Democratic Party come from uh, members of the, of the Zionist persuasion, uh, Jews, plutocrats, who gave a lot of money to that cause, uh, and who, who put it first and foremost. One must take one's hat off to them uh, for being so actively engaged in politics and being so effective in imposing their narrow view on the broader body politic. But the fact is that our politics are venal, corrupt, and open to this sort of influence on foreign policy now, because we don't believe foreign policy really can counts for much. A senior White House official, Amos Hochstein, uh, mentioned uh, to Arab officials that uh, the weakening of Hezbollah and the uh, situation that Karim just described in Lebanon, he described it as, quote, unquote, an opportunity to potentially break a political impasse in Lebanon. Is that a wise policy shift on the part of the Biden administration to get dragged into the chaos of Lebanese politics? Um, I don't think it's wise at all, but remember who uh, Mr. Hochstein is. <laughs> he is a veteran of the IDF. He is a dual national. Uh, this is uh, you know, a ridiculous situation where the envoy of the United States to deal with uh, Lebanon is an Israeli national. Um, this is uh, a, a, a disgrace, really. And uh, so whether he represents anything other than a hybrid version of Mr. Netanyahu's ver uh, vision of establishing Israeli hegemony and turning Lebanon into a satellite state or something beyond that is unclear to me. In any event, uh, I don't think the White House has evidenced any wisdom. I wanted to say, uh, Khalil, if I may, Please. Uh, just to buttress the point that American policy is not driven by strategic reasoning, but by domestic politics. I happen to know uh, one of the machers, the great power brokers in the Jewish community, now dead, uh, who was at a meeting with Lyndon Johnson in Long Island in 1964. Lyndon Johnson had inherited the presidency from John F. Kennedy, who was assassinated. He was very unsure of himself, correctly so. He was running against Barry Goldwater. Uh, Barry Goldwater had the ardent support of the American right. And at this meeting, there were about a dozen members of uh, the a very prominent wealthy Jewish uh, donor class. And Lyndon Johnson did an explicit deal. Everybody forgets that after Suez, the United States had an arms embargo on Israel. He agreed to lift that arms embargo in return for electoral support. That is the basic bargain that drives U.S. policy to this day. I think it is collapsing because the kids won't have it anymore. Uh, but um, it'll take time. And of course, we don't have much time because we're watching a rampage by Israel through the region, which is enormously destructive, ugly as it can get, and nobody's doing anything. And I think uh, 
somebody pointed out uh, correctly that uh, Mr. Biden has the technical ability to stop this war. I think, uh, you know, he could do that. It, if Israel were, were deprived of further weapons and munitions supplies, within two weeks it would come to a halt. Uh, this is what General Brick in Israel has said, and he's correct. Um, so um, uh, why didn't we do that? Well, the answer is we're in an election campaign. And the basic bargain that I mentioned is still alive. Uh, so uh, we need to kill that bargain. 